we are recording now good morning i was just going over uh, two reasons why the jordan curve theorem needs a proof uh, one is what i explained yesterday that it's not about uh, curves that are easy to imagine it's about all simple closed curves right and um, there can be curves that are not that easy to imagine and so this statement requires a proof um another reason is that this statement is not true for other surfaces like the torus which is basically the don a donut right so on a torus you can draw a curve that will not partition the rest of the surface into two disjoint sets okay so any proof of the jordan curve theorem needs to make use of the topology of the plane because it doesn't hold for other surfaces in general okay so those are two reasons for um, in particular i'm sure there are other reasons okay good so let's go quickly back to the jordan curve theorem so one way to remember it it's basically this drawing right you draw any simple closed curve it breaks the rest of the uh, plane into two regions and let me silent my phone sorry the interior and the exterior and um, we will okay and we will use the notation int of c for the interior and x of c for the exterior okay uh, so these are open sets if you take the closure then you have to include the curve c so the closures of these are denoted as int with a capital i and x with a capital e and in particular if you take the intersection of the closer closures then you will get exactly the curve c right because you have to include the boundary in both case okay good so one uh, consequence of the jordan curve theorem that we actually used yesterday to prove that k5 is non planar is that if you want to join any point in the exterior of c to a point in the interior of c um by an arc then that arc will necessarily have to cross the curve c at least once right um okay so that is just a consequence of the jordan curve theorem and we already used it in proving that k5 is non planar okay um another thing i want to quickly mention is that there is no real difference between the interior and the exterior and one way to one way to think about that statement is to observe using stereographic projections but i won't go into stereographic projections hopefully you have seen it in other courses to observe that anything you can draw on the plane you can also draw on a sphere and vice versa whatever can be drawn on the sphere can be projected onto the plane and this projection is called stereographic projection okay so let me just state that as a theorem uh, but we are really uh, using it as an observation um a graph g is embeddable on the plane if and only if g is embeddable on the sphere okay and once you are on the sphere it's somehow easier to see that there is no real difference between the interior and the exterior because you can take your closed curve and um i don't know what the right terminology is but you can um i guess you can morph it into the equator of the sphere and now you can see that for the equator the interior and exterior they are the same right and so that statement um in in when we are using arguments um the interior and exterior are going to be essentially interchangeable we are not going to uh, distinguish between them okay uh i like to make the joke that uh humans may be forgiven for thinking for a long time that the earth was flat uh, although there are still many irrational humans out there who still believe that the earth is flat that's a separate matter um 
they may be forgiven for thinking that the earth is flat because yeah locally it does look flat and i think that is very much because the fact that anything you can draw on a sphere you can draw on the plane so locally the earth does look flat right so anyways so we are not going to prove this uh, if you want to read about this i would suggest you look up stereographic projections but most of you probably have seen this in your other courses okay good um what else do i want to say okay so that's about all i want to say on the topological side of things let's go back to some graph theory so the question one of the questions we asked yesterday is how do you convince someone that a graph is non planar okay uh we proved using jordan curve theorem that k5 is non planar so that was theorem 10.2 k5 is non planar and likewise as an exercise you were supposed to prove that k33 is non planar right so those are two very simple um well very small graphs that you can prove that they are non planar just using the jordan curve theorem and looking at the structure of these two graphs but if i give you an arbitrary graph um it would be nice to have some more direct way to convince someone that the graph is non planar okay and um okay and so one way to do that is using krutowski's theorem that i want to tell you today so let's go back to k5 and let's make an observation supposing this is my graph k5 okay i want you to recall the operation of subdividing an edge what does it mean to subdivide an edge we have seen this before i guess in uh, when we were talking about uh, non separable graphs or two connected graphs i don't recall to subdivide an edge means to insert a new vertex on that edge right uh another way to think about it is to replace the edge by a path of length 2 okay uh but you can do this operation repeatedly and notice that if a graph is non planar let's say g is non planar and you obtain h by subdividing an edge then h is also non planar right because an edge or a path of length 2 they are not really affecting planarity right so in other words if i give you a graph and i keep subdividing edges repeatedly i will get a non planar graph if my original graph was non planar and if the original graph was planar i will get a planar graph right so this is a mere observation so let's put this down and let me put down a definition so in other words i can do this operation repeatedly so i can take k5 and i can keep subdividing edges any way i like right so this is a subdivision of k5 so let's put down the formal definition a graph h is a subdivision of a graph g uh we will also say we will also for the sake of convenience call it as g subdivision if h may be obtained from g by a sequence of subdivision operations uh let me call them edge subdivision operations just for the sake of clarity okay um an equivalent way to think about it is for all edges of the graph 
if you look at this drawing, then it becomes clear. For every edge of the graph, you can replace that edge by a path of length at least one, right? So at least one edge. So you can keep it as it is, or you can replace it by a path of greater length, two or more, right? And those definitions are equivalent. So another way to define this is a graph H is a G subdivision if H may be obtained from G by replacing each edge by a path of length one or more, right? So replacing by path of length one means that you don't do anything. Otherwise, you replace it by the path of length two or more, OK? And the observation which is basically proposition 10.3 in the text. A graph G is planar if and only if every subdivision of G is planar. Right? Uh, one way to think about this is that, um, well, topologically, there is no difference between an edge and a path of length uh, one or more, right? An edge is just an arc connecting two points. And similarly, a path of length two or more, or one or more, is also an arc connecting two points. So topologically, there is no real difference between an edge and a path which is longer than an edge, right? Uh, in the same spirit, let's also go back to Jordan Curve Theorem. I think I forgot to mention one uh, point explicitly. It's talking about simple closed curves. And why are simple closed curves playing such an important role in uh, planarity or graph planarity? It's because simple closed curves correspond to cycles in graphs. Any cycle, when you embed it on the plane, in a planar fashion, it's going to correspond to a simple closed curve, right? So that's the, and that is exactly what we used yesterday in proving that K5 is non-planar. We started with the triangle, which is a three cycle, right? So in the same spirit, a path or an edge is nothing but, uh, topologically, it's nothing but an arc joining two points, right? So there is no real difference between them which is why this observation holds. OK, is everybody convinced about these statements so far? Are there any questions or concerns? OK, if not, then a quick consequence of what we have uh, proved and observed so far is that if I give you any graph, if G has a K5 or a K33, so what do I mean by this notation? Um, here I mean let me put contains. If G contains a K5 or K33 subdivision, Oh, maybe I should put one more observation before I jump here. Sorry. OK, let me, OK, let's not do this. Let's go back to this drawing. You know that K5 is non-planar. By the observation, a subdivision of K5 is non-planar, right? So this graph that you see here is non-planar, right? Good. Now I can do other things with this graph. I can play around more by adding stuff to this graph. So let me add a new vertex and join it to these three guys. Let me add one more new vertex and join it to these two. Let me add an edge between these two. 
does everybody agree that this graph now is still non planar right it has a subgraph that is non planar and so the graph also has to be non planar because if i could get a planar drawing of the graph i would delete all the green stuff and i would get a planar embedding of the subgraph which we know is non planar right okay so another quick observation that i need before jumping to the conclusion i wanted to is if g has a subgraph h that is non planar then g itself is non planar okay and now if you put all of these observations together you can see that if any graph contains as a subgraph um a subdivision of k5 or k33 then that graph itself will be non planar because k5 and k33 are non planar the subdivision will be non planar and because it is a subgraph of the graph the whole graph will be non planar right so let's put that down if g contains a k5 or k33 subdivision then g is non planar okay so what exactly do i mean here contains means uh as a subgraph okay one way to relate this to something you already know is if g contains an odd cycle then g is non bipartite right that's the first theorem we started this course with so you can think of this in the same spirit but of course it's much more complex we are dealing with a much more uh complex uh, property of a graph planarity um bipartiteness is arguably an easier property um okay so if g has a subgraph that is either a k5 subdivision so that is what i mean by this notation either a k5 subdivision or a k33 subdivision then the graph g is non planar and now if you go back to our example this graph g if you remove all the green colored stuff you will get a subgraph h that is a subdivision of k5 and therefore the graph g is non planar okay uh g is so let me make sure the notes are correct so if this is my graph g then you can get a subdivision of k5 by removing all the green colored stuff deleting all those vertices and edges okay and that is non planar so the whole graph is non planar okay so everything so far so good is everybody convinced of the veracity of all of these statements are there any questions <clears throat> okay so one natural question of course is why are we obsessing over k5 and k33 why not talk about the peterson graph the peterson graph is non planar um right so why are we obsessing over this and that brings us to a very important result the main result of this module krutowski's theorem krutowski in 1930 proved that whenever a graph is non planar it is precisely because either it contains a k5 subdivision or a k33 subdivision so that is theorem 10.30 in the text this is by krutowski in 1930 and he showed that g is any graph 
then G is non-planar if and only if G contains either a K5 subdivision or a K33 subdivision. Right? So what we have done so far is we have proved the converse direction. If the graph contains one of these, then it is non-planar. So this is essentially easy. And this is the non-trivial direction. Hmm. So how many of you have never seen this result before? Can you please type in the chat box? Because if you all have seen, then I will say my words accordingly. <laughs> Surya, you have never seen this result. Thank you. Anyone else who has never seen this result? Who has never seen this statement? All right. So I suppose most of the others saw it probably in their previous course, MA2130. Uh, we have at least one person who hasn't seen it. So what do you feel about it? So the fact that you haven't seen it before, I would like to know how do you feel about this statement? Not very easy. Yeah, go ahead. Uh, it seems very non-trivial at first sight, but Mm -hmm. Yeah. Very non trivial for sure. Anything else? Uh, it's, it seems like it's very useful in the sense that every non planar graph has, uh, has these subdivisions. Exactly. Yeah. So it's definitely non trivial, useful. Uh, my own reaction, which uh, I, I maybe you also felt that way. For me, this was a mind-blowing result, right? I mean, the first time I saw this in a graph theory course, I was just blown off. I'm like, wow, you have these two graphs that completely capture the non-planarity of a graph. Um, so there are just two graphs. That is one really cool thing. It's not like an infinite family, because you could very well imagine, and there are results in graph theory and in combinatorics, where instead of non-planarity, you are looking at some other property. And in the right hand side, rather than having two uh, obstructions or two problematic uh, creatures like K5 and K33, you have an infinite family of problematic creatures. Okay. Um, sometimes that infinite family is known to us, which makes it nice. And sometimes we don't even know that what are all the infinite um, or what are all the members of this infinite family, right? So those are basically open problems. But in the case of planarity, that's not the case. We have just got two obstructions. Another thing why this is really cool is because on the left-hand side, you're talking about non-planar and planar, which is a purely topological property. On the left side, you're talking about something that is completely topological. On the right side, there is no topology. This is just graph theory. You have a subgraph that is a subdivision of K5 or K33. So this, on the right-hand side, you have something that is completely graph theoretical, or some people may call it combinatorial. Right? So you have the equivalence of two things, one which is topological, and the other which has nothing to do with topology. Right? And um, anyway, so those are some reasons I uh, thought that this was a truly mind-blowing result, uh, already proved all the way back in 1930s. And it has actually inspired a lot of other results in graph theory and in other areas of math, I suppose. So to, to me, this is one of my favorite results in all of math. Um, it's definitely non-trivial. It's not at all clear how you would start with a non-planar graph and how you would find out or how you would extract a K5 or K33 subdivision from it. Clearly, it requires uh, some tools. We will see a proof of this theorem in the next uh, two weeks or so. The proof we will see is by Karsten so Thomason. So the proof uh, we will see is by 
कार्स्टन थॉमसन one of the simplest proofs of the result uh it proceeds in two steps we first um reduce the problem to three connected graphs actually most proofs of krutowski's theorem uh have that first step so you first reduce the problem to three connected graphs uh i will add simple three connected although it doesn't matter it doesn't matter that this simple yeah okay uh let me not state that and once you reduce it to three connected graphs uh you apply the theory that we have already seen in particular we will be using theorem 9.10 which states that in any three connected graph there is an edge that you can contract so that the graph obtained after contracting that edge is also three connected okay so we will use theorem 9.10 for three connected graphs right so just to remind you it says that there exists an edge e such that g contract e is also three connected where g is a three connected graph with at least five vertices okay uh okay so this is the proof we will be seeing in the next two weeks but right now we are going to go into some other concepts before we make our way to that proof okay and on the way we will be covering other ingredients uh, that are necessary for that proof are there any questions or concerns at this point how many of you have never seen a proof of krutowski's theorem i'm hoping a few more people would not have seen the proof arnav thank you anyone else please raise your hand ravi thank you uh i assume surya you haven't thanks um okay so all right good and then there are quite a few students who are not in the lecture i'm pretty sure some of them have not seen the proof of krutowski's theorem because i believe in ma2130 you probably see the statement but you don't see the proof okay good all right so that's all i want to tell you about um these things and now i want to move to um another subtopic in planarity so let me start a new page so let's talk about let's talk about faces and planar duality all right <clears throat> hmm so as i said yesterday uh we will be distinguishing when necessary between a planar graph and planar embeddings of the graph right so to give you a quick example here is k4 it is a planar graph cause you can make this drawing alternatively you can also choose this nice tetrahedron drawing okay so both of these are planar embeddings of the planar graph k4 okay and for planar embeddings of a planar graph we will use the term plane graph so that i don't always have to say planar embedding of a planar graph okay so all right good so um a graph an abstract graph has vertices and edges right turns out when you embed it on the plane you can actually get some more things out of that you can define some other concepts okay and one of those concepts is the faces of a graph okay 
So probably you've already seen these things, but um, let's take a quick example that is slightly more complicated. And notice that in this module, uh, generally speaking, we are allowing uh, multiple edges and loops because um, yeah, they play nicely into the theory. So we will generally be allowing multiple edges and loops. However, it is worth noticing that a graph is planar if and only if the underlying simple graph is planar. That's actually fairly straightforward to see. Uh, so we will be relying on intuition and we will not be proving every single detail when we can kind of observe it. Okay. Uh, of course, something like Krutowski's theorem, we will be proving it. We can't observe that. But for many other things, we will um, not go into rigorous proofs. All right. So here is one example. Let's see. Let's call the vertices v1, v2, v3, v4, v5, and v6. And let's call the edges e1, e2, e3, e4, e5. Let's call this e6. Let's call this E7, this loop. Let's call this E8. I'm sticking to the drawing I have made in my notes. E8. This is E9. And this is E10. OK, fine. All right, so if you look at this planar graph or plane graph, You can see that this plane graph partitions the rest of the plane into a bunch of regions, right? One region, for example, is the region that you see here. Uh, let me just call it F1. OK, this is one region. This is. Let me just label all the regions so that you will get the idea. And then I will put down the formal definition. OK, so you have F1, you've got F2. You've got here, there is a region F3. There is a region here, F4. And there is a region F5 here. And there is the outside region F6. OK, so. Hopefully, the example illustrates what regions are, right? A region is a, if you want to make it topologically precise, it's a maximal, it's a maximal area of the plane uh, where you can connect two points arcwise, or it's arcwise connected, right? After removing these uh, edges and vertices from the plane. So when you remove the vertices and edges from the plane, yeah, this is one way to think about it. Take your planar graph or plane graph. Remove all the vertices and edges, right? Think of it as a physical model. Remove all the vertices and edges, and now look at all the connected pieces that fall apart. And these are the faces of your plane graph. Okay? So let's put down the definition a plane graph. When there is no scope for confusion, I will use just G instead of G tilde. Because here I'm referring to a plane graph. But when I need a graph and an embedding, I will use the tilde. Right? A plane graph G partitions the rest of the plane into a number of arcwise connected. open sets, OK? And these open sets are called the faces of the plane graph. Sorry, didn't mean to put it till the, OK? Good. So in this particular uh, plane graph, we happen to have six faces, OK? <clears throat> Good. So let's put down some more notation. So f of g is going to be the set of faces 
of a plane graph G. Right, so we have the vertices V of G, we have the edges E of G, and now we also have the faces of a plane graph. Right, we can't talk about the faces of a planar graph, right, because we need an embedding to talk about faces. Right, all right, and in the same spirit, little f of G is going to be the number of faces of G. Okay, and in the same spirit, I think I may have uh, mentioned this before, little v of g is the number of vertices, which we are also denoting by n at times, and uh, little e of g is the number of edges of any graph. Okay? Okay, good. So most of you have probably seen Euler's formula in your previous courses, maybe even a proof of that. So that's definitely something we will be seeing in this course again. Um, but yeah, we won't spend too much time on it. So that is one of the reasons we need all this notation. But if you haven't seen it, don't worry about it. We will get there. OK, so some more concepts related to faces of a graph. So let's talk about the boundary of a face. right? So if you look at this graph here, and if you take the face uh, f1, right? So what is the boundary of it? Well, the boundary of the face F1, or let me put F5, for example. I, I think it's more interesting. Yeah. Let's draw the boundary of F5. So it is exactly what you would think the boundary is, right? And so it's all the it's the entire subgraph that can be uh, that is on the boundary of that face, topologically speaking. Okay, so okay, so this is what it looks like. This is your face F5, and on the boundary you have the vertex V6, vertex V5, V1, V4, and you have a bunch of edges E5, E4, E9, and E10. Okay. So this subgraph is the boundary of the face F5. It is everything that is touching the face F5. OK? Different embeddings of the same graph will have different faces, right? Yeah. Um, yes, definitely. So in fact, yeah, let me give you a quick example. Let's see. Uh, not complicated enough. So let's see, what are the faces here. Here you have a face which is a four cycle, bounded by a four cycle, boundaries four cycle. Here you have a three cycle, three cycle, three cycle, three cycle, and this is a four cycle. But now if I draw it differently, let's see. What do I get? I now I don't get, oh, I still get a four cycle here. Yeah, I still get two four cycles and a bunch of three cycles. Yeah, not a good example. So, yeah. Hmm. So in general, it is true. Yeah, different embeddings will give you different faces. Uh, certain things will remain invariant. That is one of the things that Euler's formula is going to tell us. Um, but the boundaries of the faces, for example, could be different. I can't think of a good example right now. But yeah, it's actually not difficult to construct one. I'm just going to do it a bit later. Yeah, so the faces are totally dependent on the specific embedding you choose. And we will see examples of that in a bit. OK? All right, so let me just put down some 
terms the boundary of a face F is the boundary of the open set F in the topological sense, right? So it's everything that you can, you are touching, uh, to put it in a layman's terms. Okay? And uh, we will also say that the face is incident with all the vertices and edges on the boundary, on its boundary. So our face here, F5, is incident with vertex V6, V5, V1, and V4. And it is also incident with the edges E5, E4, and E9, and E10. OK? So just for the sake of completeness, a face is incident with the vertices and edges in its boundary. Um, okay, and another thing we need is when are two faces adjacent? So two faces are adjacent if they share an edge on the boundary. Okay, to give you an example here, F5 is adjacent with F6, adjacent with F1, and is there anything else that is adjacent with? I think that's it. It is not adjacent with F4. Although they share a vertex, they do not share an edge. OK? So we will say that F5 is adjacent with faces F1 and F6. OK? So. Two faces are adjacent if their boundaries have an edge in common. Okay, good. Okay, so yeah, lots of terms, a bit boring. All right. Um, how many faces is each edge incident with? If you look at any edge, how many faces is that edge incident with? Two. There is one problem. There is a particular kind of edge that is not incident with two faces. If you, yeah, so does anyone see that? There is an edge in this drawing that we have here, bridge, exactly, or what we are going to call a cut edge. Yeah, E10. So, yeah, so E10 is a cut edge, and that is not incident with two distinct faces, right? Okay, so let's not worry about cut edges. Supposing your graph doesn't have cut edges, then every edge is incident with two faces. Right? So if you were to define the length of a face as the number of edges it contains, we will call it the degree actually, uh, then you would sum up the lengths of the faces or the degrees of the faces, then you would get twice the number of edges because every edge is counted twice. Okay? It's similar to the handshaking lemma. You sum up the degrees of the vertices, you will get two times the number of edges because each edge is incident with two vertices, except for loops. That is why we count loops twice when we are counting the degree of a vertex. Okay. In the same sense, we are going to think that a cut edge is incident with the same face twice. Okay, so this edge E10 here, it is incident with the face F5 on this side, and it is also incident with F5 on the other side. 
So if you make this change for convenience, then you can get a nice formula. OK? And that is the motivation for the next discussion. So um, let me put down this. Observe that each edge is incident with two faces. Um, just like each edge is incident with two vertices. There is an exception here, except for loops. And in the same sense, there is an exception here, except for cut edges. OK? All right. So what we will now do is we will define the degree of a face as the number of edges on its boundary, where we will count all the cut edges of the graph twice. OK? So in this spirit, the degree of a face, uh, let's say the face is f, then the degree is going to be d of f, just like d of v is the degree of a vertex, is the number of edges in its boundary uh, where you count cut edges twice. OK? Also, Shivam had asked, can you get different embeddings? Well, yeah, different embeddings can have different faces. Uh, well, that needs you need to define what you mean by different faces. So one way to talk about or to formalize that is to look at all the faces and look at their boundaries and think of them as subgraphs of the original graph. So one way to get a different embedding of this graph is to take this cut edge and flip it to the other face. So draw it here. And if you draw it on that side, then your faces will be different, for example. right? So that's one simple example. You can construct uh, more interesting examples. Um, right? But here is one example where you just flip the cut edge, and the set of your faces will be different for the two different embeddings. Okay. Uh, good. Okay, so I want you to recall that in the case of degree of a vertex, we counted loops twice. Degree of a vertex, we count loops twice. And so now, with these observations, we get the following theorem. That if you take any plane graph, and you take the set of the faces of the graph, and you sum up the degrees, you will get twice the number of edges of the graph. right? This is often called the, <laughs> uh, it's generally called the dual handshaking lemma. You will see why it's called dual soon. Um, some people like to call it the face shaking lemma, which is a bit weird. But anyways, um, right. All right, so. Are there any questions at this point? OK, we are already uh, over the time. So let me stop here. And we will continue from here um, on Monday. And in particular, we will be talking about planar duality. We didn't get there today, but we will get there very soon. OK? Um, all right, I'm still here for another five minutes or so, after which I have another commitment. So feel free to ask any questions that you may have right now.
Also, Surya, if you could uh, stay back, I could have a quick chat with you. Uh, yes, sir. Yeah, regarding the collaboration. Yes, sir. Thanks. Okay, so everyone else has left. Uh, let me stop recording.